Welcome to Project Me, the podcast. I'm your host, Tiffany Carter, the founder of Project Me, multimillionaire entrepreneur, former TV newscaster, money-making expert, female empowerment speaker, and self-proclaimed office supply addict. My mission is to take the mystery out of making big money. Every week on Project Me, the podcast, I'll share success tips, strategies, and stories from other entrepreneurs, experts, and millionaires, showing you exactly how you can achieve your most exceptional life. Now let's get to it. Are you tired of grinding away to make money, feeling like you need to clone yourself to make your business a success? I know I was once there too, working 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week with no me time and totally overwhelmed. I knew there had to be an easier and more fun way to make massive money. And that's when I discovered passive income. Fast forward years later, and now I consistently make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year while I sleep and with little of my time. My Lord, is this a freeing and empowering feeling. It's my mission and passion to teach all of you to do the same. So I created the exclusive Project Me Passive Income Posse, where I directly teach you how to incorporate passive income streams into your life and business. If you desire the same financial freedom I've created, message me on Instagram or Facebook at Project Me with Tiffany, and I will send you the group application requirements. We're keeping this group small so everyone gets customized guidance and attention. All right, now back to today's episode. Welcome to the podcast and posse project me with Tiffany Carter. Today I have on someone I'm super excited to interview. I've worked with her before, which makes this interview going to be it's going to be really unique, you guys. It's Kate Taylor, and she's a fashion stylist and a high six figure entrepreneur. Just five years ago, you guys, she was going to be a doctor, like legit doctor. (laughs) And she was doing fashion styling on the side. And was like, this is my thing. This is what I'm going to do. So, I mean, that's a crazy diversion. I'm so excited to hear this story. What's up, girl? Hey, so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. So you guys have a little perspective, how I know Kate. So through one of my um, friends, Jordan Duvall, I did a VIP branding shoot when I started Project Me with Tiffany, which isn't even a year old, which is crazy to even fathom that. And so part of why I... I worked with uh, Jordan, right, is because it's a it's a one stop shop. I got a stylist. I didn't have to do shit. And that's how (laughs) I met Kate. And then we it ended up that we actually in part of her education, we both went to Emerson College in Boston. So we just hit it off. And the the rest of the story will unfold. Sight. Yeah, it was love at first sight. <laughs> so but I didn't know that your path. Yeah. What the fuck happened? Your path was <laughs> to be a doctor and you had like recommendations from like Harvard doctors like tell yeah. me this is crazy. Yeah, I know it's nuts. So I my whole life had just been on a track to become a physician. I had looked up to my cousin, who is um, chairman of the of the board and like chief of her department, all kinds of stuff at her hospital. And she was always someone I idolized. So literally there are pictures of me when I was about three years old, wearing my mom's white button up t-shirt. And it was my doctor coat. And I was just like, I'm going to be a doctor. This is just how it's going to be. So undergrad, I was a health science uh, major with pre-med emphasis. I did all kinds of medical work. I was, I worked at the hospital. I was, um, (laughs) This, there's so much stuff I'm going to say, and you're going to be like, what is happening? I was the f- health and nutrition specialist for the fire department of our county. <laughs> what? <laughs> I know. So my, my friends like to make fun of me because there's so many different things that I've done. It's easier to say, like, what has Kate not done? Like, that's a quicker list. But anyway, I was just, like, needed to be in science and medicine and, and whatever I could do to stay in it. <clears throat> so I moved. I finished undergrad, obviously. Took, I should have known. I mean, I took a brief little um, respite where I worked for a clothing company. I designed clothing, I sold it, I did all kinds of stuff. This was between undergrad and grad school. This was before I moved to Boston. And I was just like, I need to go to Boston. Like, that's where Harvard is. That's where I'm going to get into the good schools. Like, I'm still on track to be a doctor. So at the time, the medical schools were saying, you need to be 
because you have a science undergrad, you need to get something different for a master's degree. So you're considered a well-rounded student. This was at the time, I mean, it changes probably like every year, I'm sure. But at the time it was like, we want well-rounded students. So I do a search for the best leadership, organizational, corporate communication, um, master's degree in the country and up pops Emerson. And they had the number one program at the time for this specific, it was just like, and here's the funny thing is it had a strong emphasis on leadership and entrepreneurship. So again, I should have like kind of known that that's why I was drawn to it, but no, I was still like in the medical bubble. So I was like, okay, great. I'll do that. And I talked to some medical schools and they were like, yeah, that would be wonderful, et cetera. So I moved to Boston, go to Emerson. And the very day that I moved here, I didn't know if I was accepted yet. I was like, I'm going regardless. I got accepted to Emerson and I got a, um, like a grant project job at Children's Hospital. So I basically reached out to Children's and said, I will literally wash the toilets. Like just get me into that hospital because it's the number one children's hospital in the world. And so I was just like, I got to get in there. Like once I get in there, I proved to them that I could do this. Long story short, I worked there for five and a half years. I like started a grant project. They then created a position for me to be in charge of the physicians um, that were in training in one of the departments. And I did it for five and a half years at the same time, you know, full time. And that same time I was getting my grad degree full time and finished the grad degree, took post grad courses. And once I finished all that, I started tinkering back into fashion and beauty and I would spend my every waking moment doing fashion and beauty. I was, I was apprenticing with this artist in Boston and we were working with celebrities. We were working with runway, you know, all the glamorous things. And I couldn't get enough of it. I mean, my every weekend went to it. I never saw my friends. As soon as I would finish the hospital, I would go straight to working this job with her. That's how I got into the styling of photo shoots and things like that. Cause I would get to work with the stylist on set. And I had, because I was at Children's, there's Harvard physicians there and they teach at Harvard. And they had written me glowing recommendations to be accepted to medical school. And I had everything ready to go and I just wouldn't send it in. So I had to have like a come to Jesus moment with myself of like, why the fuck won't I send this in? And I realized I didn't want to do it. There were doctors around me that just they were the same exact way that I would have been, meaning they were high achievers, they were type A personalities. And, you know, if you want to really make a name for yourself in the medical world, you got to do a ton of research. You live at the hospital and they were missing their children's first steps. They were having to like, truly, these doctors have been in this institution for 30 plus years. Right. And they're still every year having to go to a lottery to try to pitch for their vacation week. And I was just like, what in the hell? These people have like changed the course of medicine. These are the most phenomenal pediatric doctors in the world. And they're still having to like beg for time off. Like, no. So there was just these quality of life things that I was just like, oh, this doesn't feel good. So I wouldn't send it in. All of a sudden I was like, I think I don't want to go to medical school. And now keep in mind, this had been my goal and my dream for 30 years. So the artist that I was working with at the very same time, obviously the universe has your back, just basically said, Hey, we've gotten, we've grown so much since you've been with me. I need you full time or I'm going to have to get someone else. And I was like, this, this is it. I got it. I got to jump and do this. This is it. And I called my mom and said, I don't want to go to medical school. And she said, okay, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to do fashion and beauty. And she said, you're no longer my daughter. No, I'm kidding. She was just like, what? <laughs> I'm like, what did she say to that? Yeah. Yeah. She was less than thrilled. Um, but I was just like, look, I promise I can make it work. And she said, I freaking hope so because you have, um, let's just say high taste. And I was happy that your, your track was medicine because it could pay for the life you want. But anyway, I was just like, look, I'm going to make more of a difference this way because I'm passionate about it. And I could do medicine. And if you told me I could be a doctor tomorrow, I would still be, I mean, my friends still call me a doctor. Like I'm still the one they think it's like, they think because I play a doctor on TV or something, that I'm actually a doctor. I'm like, you, you guys should actually really go to the doctor and not actually a doctor. But, um, you know, doctors make a beautiful impact, but I'm able to make the impact I want to make how I want to make it at the scale to which I want to make it. So that's, that's kind of a 
long slash short summary of it of almost being a doctor and now being a fashion stylist. I mean, it goes to show you, though, that just because you're on a course to being Mm. one thing and you and you've spent time, money, energy, all Mm -hmm. of it, that doesn't mean Mm. you can't change courses at any point in your life. I mean, you're proof of that. Absolutely. And actually, um, this first school that I've been doing with my, I'm, I also train people how to be stylists and I have two people in there that part of me sharing the stylist school journey was sharing my own journey of like, Hey, I became a stylist by way of almost being a doctor. And two of them, it clicked for them because they, one of them was in business school and just felt like she had to drop out. She was like, I'm not passionate about it. And the other one was just in a grad program. And both of them were like, I was doing this because I didn't think, you know, being stylist could be a real thing or translate that to anything. I didn't think I could actually do the thing that I want to do. I had to do the safe thing that everyone expected me to do. Yeah. And the safe thing is soul sucking. And you can still end up doing the safe thing and be an entrepreneur because in full transparency, My other company that I still run today is my seven figure company, and that's in pharmaceutical medical. And uh, it it didn't light me up anymore, and it's safe. So that's part of why it took me so long to even start Project Me with Tiffany Carter because that's safe, that's proven, right? It's lucrative, but you know what? Safe, safe doesn't doesn't do shit at a certain point, does it? It doesn't. And at some, at uh, the, the scary place that you could get to that I, everyone that's listening to you is not going to get there. Cause obviously they're listening and they're being inspired, but that I've seen other people get to is the place of now I'm just complacent with not actually, it's the dream unrealized. I didn't actually realize the dream that I wanted. Now I'm just complacent. And those are the people that even in my own life, sorry, I set my mic, like even in my own life, I had those people, close family members included, that wanted to say, this is ridiculous. You're never going to make enough money being a fashion stylist. You're never going to, you need to stick to the doctor track. Like you're smart. You can do it. You know, you'd be good at it and all of these things. And it, because of all the personal development, all that kind of stuff, I recognized in them that it, they were just reflecting onto me their own unrealized dream. And that kind of broke my heart, you know, and that, and I see my other, my stylist that I'm training today, it's like the same thing. They have people in their life saying, this is crazy. And I'm like, you know, you have to stand, stop trying to explain yourself to people who are not willing to hear the explanation because they have their own issues. They have their own unrealized dream. They've got their own things going on. But if you know that you're meant to do it, then realize that dream. You don't have to stick with safe. I mean, now here's, here's another reality. I'm in this career being a fashion stylist, loving my job. I make more now than I ever would have as a doctor. Yep. And a lot of people don't know this. I do because I work with doctors all the time in my other company of all different levels. Doctors don't make you guys what people think they make. Uh -uh. I know many doctors who literally make a flat salary, like working at Kaiser Permanente for $120,000 a year. Absolutely. And that's like, and, and some of them, that's as good as it gets. Like, that's like, okay, great. So I'm, you know, 10 grand before taxes every month. And for me, if you told me that's what I was going to earn every month, I'd be like, great. So I'm poverty now. Like that's just, and you know, obviously things get bigger and better, but it's true. I make way more now than I ever would have as a doctor. So it's not even a financial security thing when you're doing what you're meant to do and you're lit up by it. The clients come, the people come, the money comes, but more importantly, the impact and the joy comes. So I just did a live today about how so many entrepreneurs and coaches of all varieties, coaches, teachers, mentors, whatever, don't really share the what the real deal is of being an entrepreneur. One is I think that they think maybe it's not it's disempowering. So I think there's some people that think that I think others have a selfish take where it's like, well, if I really spell the real deal and it's not all rainbow sunshine and Bali trips, um, then yeah. people might not hire me or buy my courses. But yeah. I only have people who say the real deal on the show and I know you're real. Yeah. So help help the listeners understand <laughs> you've been an entrepreneur five years. Yeah. 
take us through how those first two years look looked, you know, like where you before yeah. you really started going, oh, this is cranking cash. Totally. Yeah. My first year, um, and I'm very open about this with, with everyone, because I think that, like you said, you get more out of someone being authentic and real than someone going to Bali and almost holding a cup of coffee in their photo shoots when they don't even drink coffee. Anyway, um, (laughs) (laughs) anyway, um, yeah, my first year was a grind and I don't want to say struggle because I think struggle is a choice and suffering is a choice. But before I knew that, because I didn't know that my first year, it certainly felt that way. Um, I mean, I made 50 grand my first year. And for a lot of people, that's like, oh, well, that's great. For me, one, that's not great. It's not going to cover my expenses. Two, I live in Boston. Mm -hmm. So like, Top, one of the top three most expensive places to live. It's like New York, LA, and, and Boston. It's, it's just crazy. So, or no, San Francisco's in there too, isn't it? So it was, it was hitting the ground. I mean, I did anything and any and everything that I could to get my name out there, to be known. There was a lot of fear of people thinking, you know, there was that imposter syndrome of like, who does she think she is? Like she's been training under this artist, but like now she's calling herself a fashion stylist. And here's a, here's the big thing I did that year because I felt so imposter syndrome of, you know, this, it, this can't be enough. It's not going to be enough. I was what I called image coaching, which is styling, but it's like, I thought it had to be a coach image coaching and career coaching, like two totally different things. But I was just like, I have to offer anything and everything. I just have to make money. I just got to figure it out. Like, I'll do any, you know, you want to pay me this? Okay, great. And I was not in my power. I wasn't in any sort of clear direction. I had zero wealth consciousness training. I was living out my mother's own wealth consciousness stories day by day of like, the money's going to run out. There's never enough. Um, You know, I can't, I'll, I'll never make enough to cover everything. I'm always going to be in debt. Like all of these stories that are just very true to her, I was living them out. And my first ever package, which I still have a picture of it on my desk, is a picture of me with a check for $1,500. It was my first ever package I sold. And I, I'm i like to the moon excited. If you guys can see this picture, I look like I have just won the lotto. But that package was for a full fucking year of style. Holy shit. <laughs> so, and to give you some comparison, I have VIP clients right now and it's full on. Like we do so much for these people, but they pay me 25 grand a year. So like the difference of, you know, the difference a day makes, but I thought I'd won the lotto. Like I was just like, oh my God, someone paid me $1,500. Now reflecting back to that, if I told my assistant that now she would quit because I mean, the amount of hours I put in for that client, I probably got paid $2 an hour by the end of it because I put so much work into it. So there was a lot. I mean, it was just, I had no clear mentorship. There's a bunch of things that I think got me to where I am that I did not have that, that first year. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have a community of like-minded people surrounding me. And I did not have wealth consciousness. Those three things put together and also my connection with source, like just really like connecting with my heart and source. Those four things, when they were missing, I felt like I was dying every day. But at the same time, when I remembered those doctors saying to me, if you could do something else, anything else and still be happy, do it. I remember waking up in like panic and anxiety, but I also remember thinking, but there's no other option. This is it for me. I know I'm meant to be an entrepreneur. I know I'm meant to make an impact this way. So I just got to figure it the fuck out. When did things like, when did it shift, right? When, when was the shifting point from that first year at 50 grand where you weren't, you weren't aligned because you didn't know any better, right? I mean, no, I didn't what we know what we know at at any given time right so when you know yeah. better you you hopefully do better so when did that shift for to being like fear based grinding to 50 grand for the first year when did you start seeing that shift was it year 2 year 3 yeah so it was it was year 
two, I finally got a mentor and started getting training around the wealth consciousness and business building and all of like the crucial steps that you need. And, um, once I started getting that training, I mean, I was obviously like a forever student. So you give me content, I'm going to devour it and I'm going to study it and highlight it like a total freaking nerd. So I did that and I was just all in like anything I can learn. I was going to be the best student. And that, that second year I hit my first six figure year. So the second year I did a hundred K and that was like by the skin of my teeth, it was like one Oh two. I was just like, I'm going to do it. It kills me. But that year, so I had the, I now had the foundation, right? I had the foundation of how to do the business pieces, implementing my daily practice and the wealth consciousness and the mentorship and having that community. I was also still grinding like crazy. I mean, I had so many freaking clients and that sounds like to some people that don't have clients, they're like, probably like, oh, wow, Kate, you had so many clients. But here's the thing. I didn't have I didn't have a balance. Like I didn't get it. I just thought, got to make the money, got to keep going, got to keep going. But like at the sacrifice of what? I sacrificed my health. I sacrificed my personal life. I sacrificed my mental stability. I mean, like not to a big extent, but just like the meaning, like being in a constant state of like, oh, you know, high, high wired and anxious. So you like, yeah, I did it. But then that year three is when I had the same mentor and she was like, look, cause I said, you know, I want to make a quarter million dollars this year. And she was like, look, you can do that. I have no problem with you doing that in your year three. What I do have a problem with is you doing it the same way you did it last year because you were miserable with yourself, not with other people. Well, probably with some other people, but like not with her, but she just saw I was, an, I was working too hard and I was getting myself sick. So then year three is when we started to transition. Okay, how do we change packages up? How do I just do what I love, what I'm excited about and work with dream boat clients? So there was a little, you know, every year there's more and more tweaks. Every year I've gone up. Last year I was dealing with um, remnants of that year of, of push, push, push. Um, just like going through doctor's appointments and stuff. And my mentor last year put me actually on a six month sabbatical from offering any kind of packages. So I still supported the clients I had, but I had enough coming in to where I could do that thing, thankfully. And I still made more than I had made the previous year. I still made, um, 350,000 last year and that was taking six months off. So it's all about the structures. And this year I'm actually on track now that I've been able to work. We're actually on track to do 750. So it's like everything happens for a reason. And once you get those tweaks, it's completely doable. You just have to like really know that there's suffering and struggle as a choice. You don't have to. It's, it's absolutely a choice. But when you don't know any different, you know, that's, that's what we're – I just think it's like this innate thing in us that we're just – maybe it's an American thing. I don't know. But it's like the harder you work, the more you get. I was I was raised this way in a lot of my episodes. I talk about this. And when I do the money mindset work with my clients, my mom's an entrepreneur. The last thing I wanted to be was an entrepreneur. This woman worked no joke, 12 to 14 hours a day, much like how you did your first year in business yeah. and yeah. identical to what I did, because we did live a very nice life in that sense. But my mm -hmm. mom was, I mean, my mom has an eating disorder. And I truly believe that started from her trying to have some semblance of control oh, of the yeah. chaos. I mean, so I was like, I will, I used to say I will never be an entrepreneur. So yeah. I, I get what you're saying. So let me ask you this. When mm -hmm. you're scaling, right? My belief is, and my experience um, in working just with thousands of people is that you can only do so much as one person. If you keep mm -hmm. trading your time, so to speak, for money, right? You could only have so many one-on-one -on -one clients. You can only have totally. so many of those $25,000 a year clients, even if they paid you 100 a year, because those type of VIP clients, they want Kate. They don't want Kate's assistant, oh, yeah. although it's okay for some things, but they want Kate. You know, They oh, want yeah. Tiffany. And that's where even if you do actually love what you do for them. Too much of a good thing is still too much. You're so on point. And I even said for 2019, I said to my assistant, I am not taking 
any more VIP clients unless there's someone who is like, blow my mind amazing and is begging me to be a VIP client. It is so full on and it is so much work on my part. I have my, my assistant. She for a while was only working on one VIP client. I mean, every hour I was paying her was just for this client. And it was just like, yeah, it's great to say we've had all these VIP clients and it's fun for me in that I get to, I know how much I'm helping them, but at what cost, right? Like then the dream boats that I love working with doing the photo shoots, like what we did, or like my just six month clients that are just my high level or my 12 month, those guys are just amazing. Like I vibe with them. It's fun. I'm like, Oh yeah. Call with Tiffany. Like I get so into that. And the other piece was like, this is not, I would much rather have three 12 month clients than one VIP at that when it comes to that. Right. right. And I, and that's where we look at scaling, right? You have to look at it differently because that it's like, well, God, Kay, I would, ra- you know, I'd rather have one or two VIPs because it on paper looks like more money, but you can't just look at the money. You mm-hmm. have to look at the time and energy and resources it takes to satisfy that person. So it looks to me from the outside without, you know, seeing all your books or your business, it looks to me like an order for you to have scaled you had to have money be working for you when you're not working. So is that why you developed your stylist school course? Yeah, great question. So yeah, I mean, there's only so much of me to go around. And the more the more time goes on and the more years pass, I've gotten more, even more particular about the clients I'll work with. Because now I can be, right? Like I know how to make an easy quarter million dollars just styling and that's like... I can do that with my eyes closed. But when it comes to scaling, I've always, one, wanted to have my business working for me, not me working for my business. Two, global impact has been deep in my gut for probably since I was three. And three, I've always had some sort of leadership passion in me where I wanted to train and teach in some sort of way, which is funny. You said, I'll never be an entrepreneur. My mom was a school teacher, which tells you some of where the wealth consciousness came in. I always said, I will never be a teacher because (laughs) she struggled and she was here visiting the other day. She flew up from uh, Florida and she was like, so how's your school going? And I was like, it's amazing. They love it. They freak out every call. Um, They love what I'm teaching. And she's like, remember when you said you would never be a teacher? And I was like, anyway. (laughs) <laughs> so yes, the, the stylist school, it was a three part satisfaction of goals on my end. One, I have always, since I started my business, seen other stylists that were struggling and suffering, especially in the fashion industry. I mean, it even starts with the designers. Think about designers like McQueen or, um, God, so many Chanel, like so many different designers that started out with like, I've got a dime to my name. I'm going to scrap together things like there's just kind of this air of struggle and suffer. And that makes you even more authentic. Yeah, there's like a cachet to it. There's like a thing with it. Yeah. Yes. Like the people that wear it have more money than God. But to like actually be in the know and be like considered respectable, you have to be suffering and struggling for the art. So I would see these stylists who were so freaking good at what they did but it was like, oh, no, I can't go get a coffee. I, you know, I ran out of money. And I was just kind of like, I don't understand this. Like, you have such a freaking amazing talent. You're so creative. Why aren't you just getting paid your worth? And that was something that never made a connection for me. And that was my true belief. My true money story was I get paid what I'm worth. Like, that's never been a miss for me. I get paid my worth. I get paid my value when I got true to my core beliefs. And so once I, I, I made a decision like day one of wanting to be a fashion stylist saying one day I'm going to teach these stylists how to have killer incomes. I'm going to teach them how to do it and they're not going to suffer and they're not going to struggle because style isn't something that's just, um, an extra in my opinion. It's part of your personal self care. It's part of your confidence. I mean, if you don't feel good in the way you look, how much less are you going to accomplish than if you, someone were to put you in an outfit where you felt amazing and you felt good in your bones and good in your skin, you're going to do so much more that day than you would have done in a day that you felt like crap. So 
stylists make a really huge difference. And I just made a commitment to myself. I'm going to make sure that these stylists, you know, get paid what they're, what they're worth. So that was a decision I made very early on, but I had decided I'm going to make six figures in all the different areas before I start teaching. So virtual styling, in-person styling and group uh, styling. I wanted to make six figures so I could say to anyone that wanted to be any kind of stylist, I know how this works. I can do it. You have proof so, of concept as I was what I call it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that was one of the reasons. The second reason was impact. I've seen since I started my business also little KTIs all over the world in like Paris, New York, LA, KTIs being KT Learn Internationals where you can come in and you either learn how to be a stylist or say you're visiting Paris and you just want to shop with a stylist for a couple hours. You don't want to commit to anything like long term, but you don't know where to shop in Paris. You could pop into a KTI and they'd be like, okay, you know, Suzy Q is, is available for a couple hours. You can go style. So I've always seen these like global KTIs, but a big piece of it is the training. And I knew I wouldn't have just any stylist. You had to be KTI trained. And so I was like, well, I got to start building this training program then if that's my goal. So it was that impact. But third, you, you hit it absolutely the um, nail on the head. It is the way for me to scale to multiple, multiple seven figures because I can run courses very easily, teach a multitude of students. And there's actually going to be a second course, which I'll tell you about, and just keep running them over and over, maybe even some of them go automated so that people can do self studies. But yeah, it's, I, there's, like you said, there's only so much of me and I can train my assistant to style. I mean, she knows how she could do it. She could take clients, but still then we're capped at like the hours of the day that I'm willing to style and the hours of the day she's willing to style. So this is a way to scale beyond, um, just needing me to always be the talent. Is your course involved live involvement from you or is it a self-paced course it is both so it is a 10-week course and there is a live feature to it which is the students have unlimited email access to me and I do a weekly group call with them on video every week where I do teaching and training and then answer any kind of questions that they have some of them that signed up within a certain time frame got one-on-one calls with me so there's the live feed feature to it. The content is on a membership site and they don't have to turn anything in. So every week we release the next week's module and they work through it at their pace. Cause most of these folks that are in stylist school have full-time jobs. Yeah. And I like, I like when things are self-paced in that way because something can come up in life or totally. some people work better at, you know, two in the morning, and some people are better yes. at six in the morning. So one of the most challenging things for any type of coach, teacher, whatever, anything, in terms of having your own business side hustling is getting the damn clients. Yeah. So how, how do people find the clients, especially when you're looking in terms of like something so specific, like, virtual styling or whatever. How did you find I mean, I get how you found some of them because you started working with someone else locally, and then you met a lot of people and there was a lot of networking. But in terms of online, do you teach people how to find clients on the interwebs? Yeah, so that's in the second course that I was saying is is upcoming. That one's going to launch uh, when did we say that one is launching? That one's launching in August. That one's going to be called Business of Styling. So the first course is stylist school. So that's teaching the foundations of styling, how to be a stylist, everything from fabric to fit to function to setting up a client appointment to helping a client figure out their personal style. I want them to first understand how to be a freaking awesome stylist. The second school is business of styling. That's sales, marketing, you know, packages, pricing, all of that kind of stuff. But I won't let them touch that until they understand the art, the creativity, and the actual step-by-step -step of let's get – because so many of these people have said, and this was a lot to do with my marketing for this course, this is a dream to them. It's like, oh, this is just a dream. That's just a dream. I can't actually be a fashion stylist and get paid for it. So my thing is stop making it a dream. Let's actually put a plan behind this because it can be I'm, – I'm, there's nothing that makes me any more fancy 
you know, me making 750K this year, I'm not the only stylist in the world that gets to make that. Like anyone has that capacity. There are so many people in this world that want to be styled. So that will be in the second course. Now, how did I specifically um, find clients? Online, you were asking. Yeah, most of the most of my listeners. I mean, they do off offline too. But a lot of yeah. people have this notion that they just put together a really cute Instagram with a good bio, and they post regularly, and the clients just come. So I want you to speak to that. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh my God, I wish that was the case. I would, if that was the case, I would have like three thousand people in my stylist course right now. Um, no, yeah, there is a lot of strategy behind it. It's not just having a pretty Instagram grid, although that's great and you should, but that's not, you can't just do that and be like, now I'm going to meditate and wait for the client to knock on my door. Like, no, you have to take inspired action. So you got to get some real, this is what I'm saying is why my first year was like chaos for me there. I didn't have the structures and the plans. So for me specifically, I can speak to mine. I knew that I wanted to add virtual styling. I was already doing well in the in the one-on-one styling piece, but I wanted to add the add the online piece. So for me, it was who is my ideal client? Who do I want to start working with in the online world? Because it could have been anyone, right? It could have been just like business owner, owners all over the world, public speakers. I mean, everyone's online. There's like nine billion people in the world, and like five billion of them are online. So you know, there's a lot of people you could work with. For me because I'm an entrepreneur and because I was having my own journey and I've always been lit up by entrepreneurs, I felt very called to entrepreneurs. So it was like, okay, <clears throat> I know that I love entrepreneurs. I think they're amazing. I think they're badasses for doing this. If everyone in the world could do it, they would, but they don't. There's a small group of people that do this. And that to me is exciting. So I just had to figure out where does my ideal client live on the internet? Where do they spend their time? Where do they spend their money? What excites them? What are they interested in? Do they go to Soul Cycle? Do they read Goop? Like what, you know, what do they do? Where do they live online? And I did a lot of research on that. And then I just started speaking to those people. Um, One of the biggest things that helped me is I got on the phone. I literally offered um, like 30 minute virtual styling things if people would just let me interview them. Because here's what I found is there's three things that will get you the right uh, or will get you the sale. It's the person, the pain, and the pleasure. The person is who are you talking to? The pain is what are they dealing with that they wish wasn't there? And the pleasure is how can you fix that? How can you be the person that provides the pleasure for them? So I thought I have my own words around it. I know my own system. I know my own process. And I was trying to speak to it and it was falling flat. So I interviewed some of my dreamboat clients that are like want to be clients. They weren't actual clients. People I would love to work with just said, can I get on the phone with you for 30 minutes? I've got like 10 questions that I would just love to ask you. And <clears throat> I'm happy to you know style you for a half hour or whatever as an exchange. And I did that. And it was the best thing I've ever done because I asked questions that were very specific to me and to the client I wanted to work with. So I got the words right out of their mouths and used that in my copy. So when I would say, what do you not like about your wardrobe? What do you like about your wardrobe? What do you wish it was looking like? How do you feel every day? What frustrates you? What excites you? And I got their words. Then I just took those words and put them onto my Facebook ad or my Facebook business page or did a live and talked about, if you're feeling this way, here's three tips on how to not feel that way. Here's three tips on how to feel better. Put it on my Instagram, gave away free guides on how to not feel this way. There's a lot of people that were very focused, which I never was, but I realized it was because I just kind of got it. There were a lot of people very focused on the psychology behind color. And for me, I just knew what different colors meant. So it wasn't something that I felt like I needed to focus on. But there was a lot of people that did it and they were very curious. What are my colors saying? Like, what does it mean? So I thought, oh God, that'd be easy for me to put together. So I did put this guide up, to, you know, what your branding colors are saying about you. Started to build the email list, started to send emails, you know, as much content as I could instilling in them that their style was important. It was crucial 
and they could be doing so much more and achieving so much more if they felt good in their bones and good in their body and good in their skin and good in their clothes. So it's not just an Instagram grid. <laughs> I, I, I love, I mean, I love that. That's why I had you on because I knew you would keep it real on what it takes and what it takes isn't, isn't rocket science. It is, but it is a lot of work. There is a lot of effort. There is a lot of content and consistency. Let me, this is what I, something I ask a lot of my guests. What do you think sets apart someone who is going to be a successful entrepreneur and someone who's just going to fizzle out or quit? Because most oh entrepreneurs are, actually don't succeed. So what do you think it is that, that sets, uh, sets that apart? This is such a good question. Can I give you a list of like five things? Yeah. <laughs> Cause I think, I think it's a couple of things. I think it's what I talked about in the, in the onset, which is, I believe you should have at least two, maybe three important people in your life, a mentor. So someone who's pouring into you, a peer, someone who's walking alongside you and someone you're pouring into or working with whatever. So people that are going to fizzle, in my opinion, don't have a mentor. So they're not having someone keeping them, them accountable. They're not having someone that they can bounce ideas off of someone who's further in, along in their journey that can give them some insight and some wisdom. Um, they don't, people that are fizzled don't have a community surrounding them of at least some business besties that they can talk to, that they can just get encouragement from just some real raw truth in their life. Um, they're not taking their daily practice seriously. So like the wealth consciousness piece, reading the books, doing the journaling, whatever it is, meditation, whatever it is that you're called to be your daily practice they they don't see it as important because they just want to be in the hustle. Um, the fourth thing is they're choosing struggle and suffer somehow that's serving them. Right. So they'd much rather look busy. They'd much rather have a to-do list that they just keep adding to and trying to check things off rather than taking inspired action to make their business grow. Because if you really look down to it, a lot of people just have a to-do list so that they feel important or feel busy or feel like they're doing something. And it's not actually accomplishing anything. My mentor says done is better than perfect. So like get it done and get into action. And then the fifth would be that they're not taking the inspired action. So like really tuning in to source, to your heart, to all of those things and saying, okay, yeah, I've visualized, I know my beliefs, I've got my wealth consciousness, I know I can do this, but then like listening for what is the inspired action? Because maybe that inspired action is email these 10 different people or go do an event, go do a speaking event, like get into action. Like I said, it's not, someone's not going to just come bang your door down and be like, can I please give you 750 grand to just like be around me? Cause that would be cool. Like that doesn't happen. You have to like, as an entrepreneur, there's work. And certainly as you grow and get bigger, you can add team and you can take some of those pieces off that makes sense to take off your plate so that you're more supported and you can focus more on your zone of genius. But when you're starting out, don't expect things to just come to you in the sense that here's, here's what I mean by that. Don't be a princess. Like don't have this princess mentality of like, I just deserve it all. It should just all come. I've made a decision. And now like, I'm just waiting for it to happen. That to me, I, like irks me to no end. Be the fucking queen of your business and rule your empire. Like, here's how this is going to go. Here's how that's going to go. I've made a decision about this. I'm going to take action there. I'm going to provide this for my client. Like get into some real serious action. And one thing that I will say working with you, because I've been a client of yours, so I I can speak to that, is yeah. something that sets you apart. And the only people I will work with in my life now in terms of have on my team or have as friends or as, you know, or my coach is someone who over delivers. Yes. As someone who over delivers. I have never heard coming out of your mouth right? I also didn't disrespect your boundaries, but I've never heard <laughs> come out of your mouth. No, I can't do that. No, I'm not going to do that. No, I don't have time Absolutely. for that. Oh, no, we're gonna No, you're taking you know, you it's nothing was beneath you, so to speak, you weren't Absolutely. you weren't like, Oh, well, the next call, you're gonna just be on with my assistant. It's like, 
And I love that you don't, that is something I notice as a big, big red flag that I'm seeing a lot of millennials, especially making is they don't want to do the grind and the, the grunt work. And guess what? Most successful entrepreneurs I know, if they, you know, I know someone is a restaurant chain, okay? If they go in the bathroom and the bathroom's messy and they can't find the person who cleans it, they'll fucking clean it. I have a, I had a video shoot, a TV station came to my house, okay? And I knew these production guys wanted, we're going to want coffee and snacks because that's all they do, it seems like, is eat and drink coffee, <laughs> right? I didn't go, yeah. I didn't say to my coordinator, can you go make the coffee? I just fucking made the coffee. Do you see what I'm saying? And it's like, uh, that's, you, that's yeah, an you're, issue. You're preaching to the like, part of my heart that lights up when I hear stuff like this, because I mean, let's look back on my jobs. The one at the hospital, I said, I will clean the bathrooms. I don't care. Just get me in the fucking door. That's also how I was with the artists. When I decided, like, I know what I know about fashion, what I'm not particularly an expert at is beauty. So I made a decision. I need to get trained in that. Right. I email, I looked up number one artist in Boston, a name popped up. I literally emailed her and said, I just want to watch what you do. I will clean your brushes. I will clean the bathrooms, whatever it takes. I just want to help so I can watch you. Nothing was beneath me. And guess what? I did clean the bathrooms and I did clean her brushes and I was happy to do it because I would, not only was I getting trained on makeup, I was watching a female entrepreneur build a business and build a brand. So it was like, this is the kind of shit you can't learn in a school. Like, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy. I said in the beginning, no weekends did I have to myself because we had weddings. We had weddings. We had events. We had everything. So I was just like, you know, th those kind of things go out the door. Now, as your business grows, you get to start make making a little concession here and there. Like, no, I don't want to work weekends anymore. But when I started and I had clients that were corporate women and they said, I am only available on nights and weekends. I was like, great. Me too. That sounds great. Like there's nothing, if you're beneath something, it's going to take you over real quick Yep. because there's nothing about your business that you shouldn't understand before someone else comes and does it for you. There's nothing in my business that I haven't done on my own so that I don't understand it first. So I know how much time it should take. I know how to train someone the way it should be. I know what it takes. And are you kidding me? Like my assistant, she does so many things, but there's nothing I don't do with her. I don't just stand there and like, mm, you're doing a great job, Audrey. Like, no, we get in there and we do it together because like you said, then the client feels supported and loved and she knows, and I've told her this and anyone that works in my team, you never tell a client, no, you just tell them we're going to work it out. Did you guys fucking hear that? Did you guys hear that? So this is someone, right, who's on track to making 750 grand, right, who's saying that. And it's like, listen, I know, I, I know, given I live in LA, I know what shit goes down with styling, okay? Even if, even if you're paying, a client's paying 100000 a year, 25000 a year, they are going to ask you to do weird shit, okay? Oh, yeah. Like hold their dirty underwear, tuck their tampon string in. I've seen a lot of crazy shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay? Oh, yeah. And I'm not saying, you know, do something like sexual or break some deep no, boundary of no, yours. No, and no. I know that's no. not what Kate's saying. But if you are saying no, like... Like if, if your, you know, if your agreement was styling, but not, you know, styling in terms of um, accessories and fashion, but not hair and makeup, right? That wasn't part of it. But yet that right. client is asking you a million questions. What do you think my hair should be with this or that? I, my guess is you're not going to say that's outside the scope of our contract. Hell fucking no. Hell fucking no. No way. Cause then, you know, then you're creating this entitled princess mentality. If you had someone that was in front of you or think about you being in front of someone else, you've hired someone, let's take style out of the game. Let's take coaching out of the game. Say you've hired someone to paint your house and you say to them, Oh, I know that I hired you to paint the walls, but I really feel like the baseboards could use it too. 
Do you think they're going to be like, sorry, that's that's out of the scope. That doesn't really work for me. Like, no, they might sort out a different price or something, but they're not going to say, well, a quality one will not say no. There's just, here's the thing. When you over deliver, and that's another thing we always say, we always set the expectation. It's very clear on what you're getting, but we always over deliver because if you have a client and you don't over deliver to the point of sacrificing yourself, like, like you said, Tiffany, not to the point of like putting yourself in any kind of harm or danger, anything that's uncomfortable. And also like beyond the scope of like what's reasonable. But if we're just talking like someone needs support in an area that makes sense in your industry and in your field, why would you not want them to end time with you or end the session with you or end whatever it is with you feeling like that was so fucking amazing. I feel so good. She got me, she supported me. And we ended the project in the best way, even better than I thought we could. You know what? I don't know why people don't see it this way, but I can't tell you how many people that I've hired over the years, whether it is I hired them as an employee or I hired them, you know, as a contract worker. I can't tell you how many people have said back to me when I've said, oh, I need you to do this, this and this, or can you organize my inbox? It's a freaking mess. I wasn't asking them because I think, you know, they're an idiot. I'm asking them because I trust them with my fucking inbox. It's actually like a very big compliment. And I can't tell you how many people I've had say, oh, well, you're going to need to get like an admin assistant, like a low level admin assistant to do that. That's that's outside. That's you're you're paying me for infrastructure. You're paying me for brand consulting. You're paying me for PR or whatever. And it you know what? It makes me feel what you just said. It makes me feel unsupported and mm -hmm. it doesn't feel good. And guess what? I eventually terminate that contract. Absolutely. Because you don't fear, feel heard. You don't feel cared about and you don't feel supported. Here's another thing I tell my team. One is don't ever tell a client no. Even if they're being so much like so extra because the VIP clients certainly can be, we never tell them no. We just tell them we're going to figure it out. We're going to sort it out. We'll figure it out. Even if it's like we bought this, um, for example, we had bought this Ferragamo belt for a client and Ferragamo was saying, we're not going to return it. And because the size didn't fit or whatever, and the client was kind of freaking out. And I said, we'll figure it out. And we fucking figured it out. So number one is you never tell a client, no, there's always a way to figure it out. And number two, don't give me excuses for why you can't give me for, give me reasons for why you can. So if we, if an, if a opportunity for growth, I like to say presents itself. So something comes up, a client needs something or something stressful. And I say, okay, the end goal is here. I don't want to hear excuses for why that can't happen. I want to hear your solutions for how we're going to get there. Because if you have that mentality, then you know everything can work out. It's all available. But if you start making excuses, it just means you're making excuses in other areas of your life. You're making excuses for your failure. You're already setting yourself for, up for a plan B. I think also, in my opinion, psychologically, why so many people um, will say things like, oh, but, you know, no, that's not what you hired me to do or, you know, whatever, all all versions of no. Right. I think there is this thing where it's like they think that that's going to get them more respect by mm. saying, you know, that I you know, I you hired me for this like that. Mm. That's a job for someone else. Like, I think there's a psychological thing. But the other flip side is that's total sabotage to me. Yeah, because here's why I think that that's not exactly um, like if people are actually thinking that I think it's wrong thinking, because if you are the CEO of your business and you're in control and you're in power, one, you will have clients that know how to respect that. And they will be asking things that might be outside of the realm of what you talked about, but it's still going to feel good to like support them in that. And two, if you feel like you need to say no to be powerful, then like, I would question how powerful you actually feel. Like, then are you actually the queen of your business? Cause if somebody asks me something we haven't talked about doing, I know in my gut right away, like, Oh yeah, let's totally, yeah, we got that. That's, that makes total sense. Let's cover you on that. That comes back to that piece of defending your position 
when you don't need to, you just need to hold it. If you're powerful and you're a CEO in your business and you're running this ship, then you just get to hold your position. You get to hold your place of power. You don't have to defend it by saying, oh no, I don't do that. That's, this is me standing in my power. Like, it's like she doth protest too much. If you have to tell me you're standing in your power, you probably aren't. Right. And <laughs> and the thing is, if you if you are that kind of person and that feels right to you, that this is these are the tasks and this is it and I'm not stepping outside it, that makes you an employee, not an yeah. entrepreneur. And guess what? Not a high level employee. That makes yeah. you an employee on the fast track to nowhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, I mean, going back to the excuses piece, it's giving you an out for like, oh, when this doesn't work out, I told her blah, blah, blah. Like, so you're already making excuses for why it's not going to work by saying I can't do that. Right. Does that make sense? Right. Or someone to blame like, oh, well, yeah. she, you know, she was over the top in her request. So that's why, right. you know, this wasn't this was destined not to work. Yeah, it's like a setup. I see what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah, it's a exactly. setup. So how can people find and get more of you? Is it on your Instagram, your website? How can they get you? Yeah, so I am Kate Taylor stylist on all the things. So Instagram, my website, Facebook, you type in Kate Taylor stylist, I'm going to come up. And that is the best. Uh, Instagram is probably the best way that we do like live things. We do the stories and you're always going to be in the know of what's happening. Um, but also definitely check out my website and get on the email list. Cause anything, if you are, if you are a stylist or you want to be a stylist, definitely go to my Instagram because there's a free guide there and you can click through the link is in my bio on Kate Taylor stylist. And it's just a guide on how to be a successful stylist. If you're someone who's interested in being styled, there's also a guide on my Instagram. There's that color guide I was talking about, um, you can message me on there and we'll get you to the email list because we always are, are letting people know what's going on there. But Kate Taylor stylist on all the things. You guys, if you loved this episode and loved hearing the real deal from Kate and myself, take a screenshot right now. It takes two seconds. Stop what you're doing. Take a screenshot. And I want you to post it on your social media and tag me at Project Me with Tiffany and tag Kate Taylor stylist. And if you forget one, I'll make sure I repost it and tag it. But this way we can tell like if you really liked hearing the real deal with entrepreneurship, like what year one looks like year two, the mistakes, the wins, how to get out of your own way. If you loved hearing this shit, you have to do that in order for me to know so I can have on more amazing people like Kate. And I just have to end with this funny thing. One of my biggest takeaways from working with Kate is like my biggest life epiphany was learning of the invention of nipple covers. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> that is that's wow I didn't even know the and then they arrived and then they stayed stuck on like I couldn't believe they stayed stuck on for like a whole day I was like this changed my entire life and that was my takeaway yeah that that is a good takeaway and that goes back to there is nothing we haven't as stylists there's nothing we haven't seen or done there's nothing you will not experience and you better have a thick bag of tricks for anything and everything that might come up and nipple covers are one of the things, because that was one of our things we were like having discussions about which bra would be best. And you were like, eh, this and that. And I was just like, we just need nip covers. Love it. I'm such I'm a, I'm like, on. that's, that's the takeaway. <laughs> <You> gotta... <laughs> <laughs> I loved having you on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be on. I hope you guys loved it. It was a pleasure to be here with you all. Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please write a five-star review on iTunes. Not only will this make me super happy, but it will allow more listeners to find our special show. Simply help me help others.